Amen. Amen. So um, the, the passage we're, we're looking at today, as we've, we've got to Matthew 18, um, is often, it's, it's got various names, um, you know, um, the unmerciful steward or the unforgiving debtor or the unforgiving servant. Um, but it's a story which we kind of know, um, if, I, if I kind of, once I put it in context, yeah, yeah, I know the story because it's one of those that we tend to know. It's about the person who owes a lot <laughs> um, and is forgiven and then takes it out on someone who owes him a little. Um, but um, it actually raises and speaks to some quite kind of complex um, issues at the heart of the difference of the faith we come into compared with the religion we might build around it. Um, and um, and some of that um, some of that kind of the heart of that 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 dynamic um, is kind of becomes very evident. Um, so just just yesterday, I was, uh, I was having a, a kind of a, a translation via Google Translate with a, with one of those Syrian converts because he's trying to understand the tension of how our relationship with the Lord actually changes us, which means that it's not our failure against some of the things that we're told to do that kind of excludes us from the gospel. But there is something in which our connection with God the Father should be transforming us in a way that we move away from certain behaviours and certain uh, patterns of thinking and so on. Um, so there's something of that transformational nature, which is the expression of, of, um, of a genuine faith. So we'll be looking at that uh, as we go through these verses um, um, this afternoon so so um, we're looking at Matthew 18 verses 23 to 35 but it's it's re- worth putting some context in from last time because obviously there's a kind of a flow in the text these verses which kind of brought a conclusion to the, the previous verses but also link into these ones so um, remember we've been looking at those whole issues of living by grace how to bring um, kind of structure so that discipline is less to do with discipline. It's more to do with managing good relationships We're about bringing up just a couple of folks with you when you've got to deal with an issue that may need addressing rather than going straight to the whole church and making a big issue of it. Um, and we looked at how that's often turned upside down. So it becomes the kind of go to approach. Um, and then in that context, um, Peter very, uh, very clearly has understood that the whole flow of what Jesus has taught about how from a leadership position we have to be careful with those who are young in their faith that was a few weeks back and um, how if we've if we're if we're in our leadership position and there are discipline issues or issues of offense being caused how we should do it in a way that that helps to hide people and win hearts rather than actually instantly goes to wanting to exclude and so on um, and, and now, and and then that was kind of summed up with Peter asking the question: <clears throat> so just how much forgiveness should there be? <laughs> um, which is the way it kind of it equates out, doesn't it? Peter came and said to him, "Lord, how often shall my brother fail in duty towards us?" So just quickly flagging, I'm um, I can hear some odd bits popping in. So if if everyone can mute, then it, it doesn't disturb others. If you um, just in case someone is walking past behind you or whatever and says something. Um, anyway, so coming back, so so you know we have that. Should I? Is it much as seven times? And Jesus answered, to "Tell you as much as seven. Um, I don't tell you as much as seven times, but as much as seventy times seven. Um, and there's, and kind of um uh, and I I actually find an interesting thing which I have say cautiously because you can you can maybe think I'm you know, very often we kind of say you must forgive forever and ever, <laughs> but actually Jesus doesn't say that. He doesn't say you must always forgive. But the the example he gives of seventy times seven is your default needs to be going f- to forgiveness. Now, why do I say that? Well, because actually the concept of forgiveness is quite fuzzy, and there are elements that sometimes we package into the idea of forgiveness, um, which are which actually become very kind of counterproductive. Now, that doesn't mean to say so. I want you to hear this carefully because I'm. Uh, you can if you want to kind of um <laughs> if if you want to get me cancelled from from youtube or something you can kind of go and say uh, <laughs> that i'm contradicting jesus i'm not i'm trying to, to draw out the tension um in the words he uses and the, the point i'm making 70 times 7 is you err on the side of always trying to go for the forgiveness and because unfortunately there are those little times where we do have to remember something um so forgetting is not the same as forgiving um, sometimes we do need to remember and be cautious 
um, but we let go of our right to vengeance, which is at the heart of things. And so I think even that is there in that it's not a kind of, oh, we'll just always forgive, always forgive, because actually we have to be cautious of the damage that is being done. And somebody can always say the way you tried to discipline that, the way you tried to say, um, to kind of think about the examples we were thinking of last week, um, to, I think I was talking about various experiences we've been involved with over the years, um, where sometimes somebody has caused a lot of damage in relationships, but just wants to feels it's their right to be in the middle of stuff, and um, and doesn't want to be kind of excluded. And there are times when you have to say you have to understand that your presence <laughs> in this community is very painful to your children. For instance, it's a very real phrase that I had to go through. Um, and someone could come and say that's not very forgiving. You see, and that's what I mean is to understand that the. That, 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 that there is a heart tendency, but actually the detail sometimes we've got to, has, has got things that need practical working out. So that was a rather waffly way of saying something that I know has a certain degree of controversy and the ability to be read and heard the wrong way from what I'm saying. <laughs> so I'm trying to be cautious in it. <laughs> um, but then Jesus goes on, you see, he takes that, that question that Peter has proposed which he's said, you know, that the erring is always on the side that that, that that do more forgiving than you imagine forgiving is worth doing. My instinct as a human being won't ever want to forgive enough. <laughs> Whereas God's God's challenge to me is to forgive beyond what feels natural, beyond what feels comfortable. So in this, the kingdom of the heavens, um, again, I've gone with the, the literal wording because um, I just like to keep on emphasizing that I do think <laughs> Matthew, as the early church tells us, was originally written in Hebrew. Um, and this is, this is one of the, the most common examples running right the way through the gospel is using the Hebrew form with the plural heavens, plural word for heavens. Kingdom of heavens is like a man or a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. So we we are we are coming now to to the idea of um, rights and what's owed in this kind of context, and um, and you kind of in the in the kind of the um, the way that the Greek flows and where the Matthew obviously it was originally said in Aramaic whether Matthew was trying to capture that, whereas he kind of doubles things up which you don't see in all translations. The kingdom of heavens is like a man oh a king. It's almost as though. Jesus is is drawing, this is an earthly representation of a heavenly principle, but perhaps a good example, not just making it earthly, i.e. a man, let's put someone with authority, um, a ruler, some kind of a ruler. Um, and in doing so, um, Jesus actually firmly kind of puts um, the, the story context into the Roman world. Um, because obviously um, uh, Judea um, and the whole land of ancient Israel is ruled over by um, the Romans and anyone who's ruling, kings and so on, are, are exercising and working under Roman law rather than Jewish law. Um, and the reason I wanted to flag that is, um, in fact, is because the story Jesus is going to tell, um, very often the church wants to make it too much a parallel of what God's like and then he comes across quite harshly. Um, I can remember several slightly ridiculous little comments that I saw in various times where um, where where atheist commentators will often say, in, in this parable, Jesus tells God's like this. And how monstrous is that? When you look at the parable, Jesus is telling a story about earthly kings who don't always behave well. <laughs> but they have assumed that, like, unfortunately, like some Christians have, that because Jesus told a story and there was a king in the story, he must be the king or God must be the king. And when the king does something bad, what he's saying is, I'm like that, which isn't the case. We'll, we'll, we'll see that a little bit as we unpack it. So here's this king. He wants to settle accounts with his servants. Um, so in this, thinking back to the verses we just looked at, <clears throat> um, we're talking about... Jesus is trying to illustrate to us the need to err on the side of forgiveness. Why it is we need to err that way? Why we need, to, when I say err, what I mean is <laughs> our tendency should be towards forgiveness. Even when our, our brain says that's too much, I've done it too often, to, we, we've got to kind of dig deeper and find ways of pushing forgiveness further and further. So he tells the story. Um, so there's, there's this king, so secular king, 
Roman ruler governor, as he began his, the settlements, one was brought to him, a debtor of 10,000 um, talents. Um, and, um, and interestingly, just to kind of give it some context, um, the, the Greek word there is a myriad, which we translate as 10,000, because that's what it num adds up to. But to understand it in a more symbolic way, um, it's the largest number um, that in Greek you can say with a single word. <laughs> so it's a bit like in the past we might have said a billion or a trillion, and then somebody says quadrillion, so now we've got another word so we can get bigger. So, so what, what's actually been said here is the easiest, the, the, the biggest thing you can say easily, the biggest number you can say easily so he, the, um, he's got a debtor of 10,000, 10, a myriad of talents, and a talent is an enormous amount of money too. Um, and it's far bigger, this, this debt is far bigger than any individual is ever likely to encounter in the Roman world. Um, just to kind of give some context um, to the thing, I think I put, yeah, there you go. Um, so yeah, to finish the reading the verses, but since, um, since he had, since he had, should have said had, missing word there, but since he had nothing to pay with, the master ordered him to be sold and his wife and children and everything he had to make payment. So I'll come to that verse in a minute. But um, just to kind of flag, so um, a talent is worth 600 denarii. <laughs> um, and so um, and if you actually add up 10,000 talents or a myriad talents is worth 200,000 years worth of an average wage. <laughs> So just to kind of now now of course you could say some people could be that wealthy but actually it's hard to imagine it really <laughs> um, but um, the average daily wage was a denarii um, and uh, so if he owes six hundred oh it's not a denarii sorry it's um, ten denarii I think something like that oh no sorry one talent is six hundred denarii yeah that's right a denarii I think is a day's roughly a day's wage is what you got paid so that you add it all up. <laughs> Um, you get 200,000 years worth of um, an average yearly wage. So this is an enormous amount. So really what Jesus is saying is he owes more than it's ever impossible to pay. <laughs> how how he lost that money, he, we don't get. <laughs> but that's not the point because, of course, it's not a true story in the sense if it didn't actually happen to someone. It's an illustrative story. Um, but the, the thing here, but since he has nothing to pay with, the master ordered him to be sold and his wife and children and everything that he had to make. So... There is a, we, we have it all excavated, there is a Roman legal system, I think it's called the Twelve Tablets, and one of the tablets has got some kind of subsections within it which are to do with the management of debts, and actually the story Jesus tells all kind of fits very, um, absolutely perfectly within that kind of um, list of options in terms of, um, you know, you can sell him off and his wife and his children, you can do all of these things. Um, and actually take the money so take them you, you've got various options you can either force them into into servitude as a slave under under your own aegis or you can sell them through the the prison systems to slavery um, and actually the prison system itself can buy them and then the work it does for the prison system is then kind of offset and you're paid for so all of these sorts of things so the story Jesus is telling is within that context so um, so it, this is it, the, the details, therefore, are more driven by Jesus telling a story that makes sense to the surrounding folks rather than him trying to make um, a spiritual point out of them. This is just the way it works. Um, so the servant, hearing, of course, fell and kneeled before him, saying, Sir, have patience with me. I'll repay you everything. There's a, a quick thing. The, the word sir and master are really the same word. They're the word kurios, which we sometimes translate as lord, but I've, I've left... I've I've not put that in here because it gets confusing. See, in some people's mind because because of this tendency and idea to think that because God Jesus is talking about a king, and he said it's there's something to to learn about the kingdom of heaven that somehow this this king who's doing this is is kind of him or God. Um, it's not. It's just a it, it's an illustrative story of a principle which is going to unpack around forgiveness. Um, and so sir and master, that word curios, but it's not, it would be confusing if we use the word Lord, which we often use in the New Testament for Jesus. So um, it's totally, totally legitimate to just say rather than Lord, we'll say sir or master here and we'll, re we'll reserve the word Lord when we're talking about Jesus. <laughs> 
So um, the master of the servant, having been moved with compassion, released him and forgave him his debt. So that's a nice thing. And like this is very godlike. He's behaving in a very godlike way. Um, uh, but then the same servant went out, found one of his fo- fo- um, fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii um, and grabbed him, throttling him. He was saying, pay me what you owe. Um, so Jesus gives a really nice, a really very kind of graphic image of the the whole process, wandering out, grabbing him by the throat, throttling away. Um, so his fellow servant fell down, same kind of phrasing again, so like he's done <laughs> at his feet, and begged him, have patience with me and I'll repay you. Um, but he would not. Instead, he went out, cast him into prison until he paid what was owed. So here again, within that sort of system, one of the things you can do is you can kind of get leverage for them to kind of draw money, borrow money from other people so they can pay you. So you can have them put into prison um, and they don't get out until they have negotiated and organized with their friends and family to, to raise the money to get you out. That that system, of course, lasted right the way through into kind of Victorian England and beyond um, where you could go to debtor's prison, which always struck me as one of those particularly cruel things to do is um reduce taking somebody away from the ability to earn money and so you can't get out until you've um until you bog, begged and borrowed from other people so you can pay back what you begged and borrowed originally from me um, it's kind of a bit of a recipe for the for the dominance of the strong and the already wealthy in this kind of situation but but this is the social context that jesus is telling the story in. it makes sense um so again, yeah, one denarii equals a day's wage, as I've touched on before. So so he owes 100 days wages, about a third of a year's salary, um, whereas the, the previous the previous person has been given 200,000 years worth of salary off. <laughs> so you, you, when you when you kind of do the math, you understand how big the blessing is compared to, to what is being demanded here. Now then, now, when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were deeply grieved, which is not surprising. And they came and told everything that had happened to their master. And then the master called him and said to him, you vicious servant. Sometimes you'll see it says evil or wicked, um, but it's it's someone who acts with, with hurt towards others. So I just thought, you, you vicious servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you have also had mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had mercy on you? And here you're getting a little bit of the the tension as why I'm saying um, we don't want to kind of try and see Jesus's illustration in an absolute sense that this king is God, um, because Jesus is using an example of this is what this is the way it works on earth. Now try and understand in heaven what's going on here, and and here in in this you'll notice it's. It's the there is grief being caused to other servants in in the situation <clears throat> that actually the, the the lack of the flow of forgiveness actually is grieving others. So now when the master is is responding, although he has a certain agenda in it himself, um, there is something which nobody would say is unfair. Um, <laughs> Because there are, it's not just him who's being hurt here, but the whole community is being hurt um, by what they see of the way in which somehow, if 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 our unkindness and our cruelness, which Jesus does forgive for us, if it has no sense of consequence within God's system, if there is no place for it being kind of dealt with that is incredibly grievous to others. Now, at the heart of this, as I say, is why it gets quite deep. You know, it's it's the challenge of the question that is often thrown, you know, at us as Christians. Is supposing supposing Hitler had had prayed the sinner's prayer um on his deathbed, you know, <laughs> would he have been saved? And you know, we we it we can try and explain that, but actually there is a there is an offence that is caused if in one sense by someone who does not live under grace actually oh, sorry does not does not express or or have anything of grace in their lives towards others being the recipient and and something in us feels that the, a deep unfairness of that and actually uh, there is something of if you like of why there is the justice of God 
um, that if there was no resurrection and there was no judgment, then there would, by definition, be incredible unfairness and injustice um, in life, because there are plenty of those who in this life have just received nothing but injustice. <laughs> And so there is something, but it, it's not something we want to be fixated on, if you like, the, the right to revenge, the right to and the right to, to withhold forgiveness, which is often the thing that's in view here. It's a complicated issue, um, and God is a just God, is going to judge fairly, but from our individual human perspectives, we'll always have things that, that would make us want to then have a reason why I can withhold um, uh, forgiveness to withhold grace from others um, whereas what Jesus is driving at with the parable is we've got to as we've already looked at in the previous part of the flow we need to err towards that side of um, I, I give I give forgiveness beyond what it feels like it deserves because of course if it, if it was deserved it's not really grace or forgiveness so we're always <laughs> drawn to do it that way um, but to understand you know there is a place for judgment and and here, of course, what we see is the guy gets his comeuppance. Um, that we sh not that that's something that we should cheer about, because actually, the point was he lived under uh, he lived under um, a, a a huge dispensation of grace for for his own transformation. But nothing has changed, nothing has transformed, um, and now suddenly he finds that that grace was almost well. It's complicated because. You can seriously make a, a, a kind of a challenge, it seems to me, of um, of saying, therefore, well, is it, is it was it ever really grace if it was never really given? Um, but I, I think that that's again trying to push the theology too far from the parable. The parable is trying to to set a sense of priority. So there is something in the justice of God that doesn't allow for people to fake their reception of His grace. It needs to be genuine. That's perhaps the way we should think about it. So shouldn't you have also had mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had mercy on you? In other words, have you really encountered the grace and forgiveness of God if it's not transformed you at all? Um, and that's a, a really important little question because I've, I do have slight kind of, it, you know, the... If, if we're too forensic, we kind of we reduce we reduce salvation to did did the prayer pray the prayer at the back of knowing God personally you know the little booklet, and if they did when they were five did God deal with them well, you know my 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 wife my lovely wife Judith, <laughs> um they had a preacher come to her parents church when she was four years old, and she sat there and as he preached she felt a conviction. <laughs> And when he called people who wanted to respond to the word, she was the only one who, from the whole church who walked forward. <laughs> and he very graciously took her into a little room and prayed with her. But she knows something happened in her because she keeps going back. Something shifted and changed. Whereas I also, if I put myself in the mix now, because I grew up in a Christian home and my dad was an evangelist, I felt compelled by duty to kind of um, go forward every time an evangelist made a statement, but there wasn't. It was it was much later in life when there something came alive in me. So so the the actions there is there is something that goes on that in one sense only God can really be the judge of, um, and we we need to take things at face value. We need to kind of treat it those ways, but we recognise that we're never the judge as to who's in, who's out. It's always God in one sense. <laughs> Our, our the challenge from Jesus you ch you chain these passages together is to be gracious forgiving and and think the best <laughs> but there there is a place where actually someone can have done the actions if you like for the sake of well I don't fancy don't fancy what might come after after death if I haven't prayed this I'll do this and bank that one put it away it doesn't ever changes me I'm exactly who I always was um uh, but actually Jesus warns us against that so in his anger, his master delivered him to the tormentors until he should pay all that belong, pay all, all being owed to him. That that little word tormentors difficult to know what to put in there. Some translations use it, and basically it is the role of those who run the prison judicial system of the Roman world, is they um they are allowed to inflict kind of various um physical punishments while you're in, which we think of as torture while you're in prison. So you don't want to be in prison for a debt <laughs> because those who are there are allowed to. It's part of making the system unpleasant. They're allowed to do what they like to you. 
Um, again, you know, this is where the tendency in our in kind of a Christian theology to to want to to sit in the seat of judgment is not always pleasant. So you can go right the way back to about the fourth or fifth century, and you find Christian writers getting quite delighted in seeing the word tormentors as being a symbol symbolism for the demonic, and this this is all about eternal judgment. The, the thing I would say on that is if it's about eternal judgment, you've got to then explain <laughs> how it is that you can actually be in eternal judgment and then pay back what's owed to you. See, So for me, it doesn't look like eternal judgment, but they, they like that. And the tormentors here are the, are the demons, you see. Because <laughs> um, then, it, then you'll say, ah, oh, but, but then it says, thus also my heavenly father will do to you unless each of you forgives his brother from your heart. So it's not necessarily that it's saying that, that God runs in heaven, a system that looks exactly like what happens in Rome. It's kind of saying there's something of the principle here that that actually the, the grace he gives us, if it if it is encountered in a genuine sense, will have produced grace in us, which will push us in the place of being more forgiving. And the the place of being more forgiving is a complicated one. And I I, I um I, I know it from self-reflection. Um, C.S. Lewis makes the point that if you find forgiveness easy, you haven't got anything that's worth forgiving, um, which I think is a really helpful little statement. <laughs> so because we, we we sometimes turn it into a platitude, oh, just forgive them. You know, that's the thing to do is what you're supposed to do. If it was easy, then there's nothing really that has really hurt. It's only when things have really hurt <laughs> that you find forgiveness is hard. And and so then you start to think, well, have I really forgiven or haven't I? You see, and this is where the kind of the fuzzy area of what's in forgiveness and what isn't. People say, oh, forgive and forget. Easy. <laughs> but actually, is that sensible? Would you say to a child who's being uh, who, who notices that when his father gets uh, gets overly, you know, drinks too much, um, if he if he's if he's downstairs and watching television, his father's like to hit him. So he goes out and plays football away from where his father is. He's not forgetting, <laughs> you know, for, forgiving in that context. There's sense in not forgetting. See, it's a much more complicated mix of things. And uh, on a, a personal bit word of testimony, I remember I was really because we, we, we went through a, a period which felt very I felt very personal, personally hurt by by people I thought were really you know were close and so on and I I was praying I, I was being asked to go down and speak at a church down in Southampton it wasn't very big I was going down on the train and I was thinking about things and I was thinking and I, I was thinking about the fact that I, I really when I would think about some of the things I'd still get really angry and I was feeling really guilty now because I was thinking I haven't forgiven those people Lord you know <laughs> um because if I if I stopped and I think about what happened I'd get angry you see and and I, and um and I thought, how can I go and take this meeting? You know, I, I'm the worst person to be able to take a meeting. I can't because I can't forgive these people. You see, <laughs> um, um, and so um, anyway, I got to do the meeting, and it was it was a weird meeting because I started. I, I I had I looked into the audience. And I can't remember what the word was. I can sort of remember the lady's face, and I had a, a word knowledge for someone that was really really accurate. And then what happened is my original things I was going to say went out the window. I just got word after word for people in the room. <laughs> Um, that that were were really you know I, I remember saying to one guy so I'm at, and saying the Lord's giving you children I can see you with two young men who aren't your sons but they are spiritually and and that day he had just formally taken on the mentoring role for for a council of two kids who'd been excluded from school you see you know it's that kind of level of you get a word of knowledge and and you share something in the mix and it's really spot on anyway at the end, at the end of the meeting because you know that been the context lady came up and said, I'm really sorry. To, she said, I just had this thing that I felt the Lord told me I needed to say to you, she said. Um, she, and she said, um, and I can't remember exactly the, the wording, but then she just said, but he really wants you to know um, that actually um, you have you have forgiven people. <laughs> um, and, and it was a kind of really direct word to the things I've been struggling with. And I thought, well, so what's the Lord saying in this? But... And as I thought about it, I thought, you see, God is angry. He gets angry. The master delivered his, um, in his anger, his master delivered him to the tormentors. The Lord does get angry with bad things that are bad. <laughs> and if I, if, I, if I actually stop and remember things that have happened to me, I, I, it's not wrong that they make me angry. But that doesn't necessarily mean you haven't forgiven someone. 
because forgiving them is not so much about the feeling it's about some sort of spiritually legal transaction in your heart where by you let go the right to vengeance you see and that was my worry that because i was still angry i was still holding on to that but but I, I really did feel like the Lord had spoken very clearly to me, both in terms of the way he'd blessed me when I was thinking I wasn't worth doing it. Because in my pain and disappointment, the things I was still working through, as I looked back on those days, I thought to myself, I don't know if I can. <laughs> so I'm, I'm kind of telling a grace-based story of how gracious the Lord is in this. Whereas in this parable, it looks like it's slightly, it's reminding us though that we, it's not just our it's not just the external actions it's about something that comes from the heart which are the final words so in the same way or thus also my heavenly father will do to you unless each of you of you forgives his brother from your heart just get the get the sense of it being at the deepest part of who we are um but as as the deepest part of who we are filters through all of the other parts of who we are <laughs> you know um it can often feel kind of messy in the flow um, but there's something where when we've really encountered forgiveness from God, it shifts us in a way. And as we, we lean into him, we, we, we should find some fruit of more grace from our lives if we've really encountered grace from him. And and the theme does seem to come into Jesus's teaching a few times, you know, so we saw it. You see it in the Sermon on the Mount. So I, I put it in here, Matthew 6. If you forgive men their trespasses, your father, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. And we can sort of make it very forensic. I must do this. God will do this. I must. Do, but what I think it's driving at is this. It's the complex tension of the grace we receive and the grace that transforms us. And in that transformation, that grace that leaves for us, that leaves from us. Um, and and it's all, it's the mark of real discipleship that we're seeing that 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 struggle that going on in us in a way that transforms us. Um, you know, G so Jesus has already said. I just thought it's always interesting to notice Jesus' brother clarifies it too. You know, so so speak and so do as men who are judged by a law of freedom. For judgment is without uh, for judgment is without mercy to him who has. Sorry, judgment is without mercy to him who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. That there's something about the grace coming from me that is indicative of the grace that's flowing into me. Um, and, and it's difficult to say which one comes first, the chicken or the egg. But they're all wrapped up um, in, in something that on a personal level, I can understand what's going on in my heart. And it challenges me to think about what's going on in my heart. Um, so I don't get too judgmental and try and get second guess what's going on inside others. But it's useful for me to kind of remember it in those ways. Um, so um, I, I on, a, on a kind of as a, on a pastoral level, um, I think these when I have the privilege of talking through with folks, some of the worst experiences they've gone through and seeing how God has met them in grace in those moments. Um, I, I think it's one of the great privilege, huge, huge privileges. When we, we I mentioned the um, uh, the Iranian guys when I was talking through with them because I wanted to know they had a real spiritual conversion. They weren't just kind of trying to run away from Islam, you know. As they <laughs> when we were going to baptize them, and one of them talked about how he'd met this young man who was a Christian, and he was the way he behaved was such a challenge to him, and he started to try and pray to to God through Jesus. And then he talked about how he had an experience where he knew that God was saying to him he had to forgive his parents for some failings that they had. And um, and and, you know, even though we were doing it using Google Translate to get the story, I got the, that sense of shiver of here is the real sign of how grace really hits someone. So he's not just kind of claiming something for the sake of something to put on his his asylum application. He's actually had a real experience which actually has challenged him to release something he's actually gone ahead and done it and and based on all of that 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 to me is the kind of almost the litmus test of um you know you prayed the prayer at the back of the book how real has it gone <laughs> has it how has it has the impact of with grace changed change me um and in the end it's always god will be the judge but that that's how i kind of put the pieces together so <clears throat> so th those are my thoughts <laughs> on on this passage and the flow of passages as i say um they've been i think the last few weeks they're often the, the tricky ones but 
it would be odd if there weren't tricky passages in Jesus' teaching because because <laughs> he is digging deeper and he's challenging us to go deeper with some of these things. Um, and then then it's then it's easy on the surface. So so it sh- it shouldn't we should expect there to be passages which sometimes are awkward to talk about because we're not quite sure how they fit with other simpler parts and and so on um, but I'm hoping in our conversation we're kind of feeling our way towards how that that tension of the goodness of God dealing with a broken and ugly world um, and how the goodness of God in his people who are trying to be transformed but still have to deal with people who have broken ugly things in them and how justice requires something that means that forgiveness forgiveness still needs to be tempered with wisdom in the mix um, but wisdom can't be an excuse for withhold, for the withholding of grace. You know that that complex toing and froing, <laughs> and we we try and work out in our community together by the Holy Spirit. So those are my thoughts. Um, Forty minutes in, <laughs> um, and look, there we go. This is helpful for me because I when I'm skimming through the video, I can see thanks for thanks for watching. So I know I've got to the end of what I said. Um, who would like to ask questions? I think I suspect someone will. <laughs> Would anyone like to, to ask any questions or make any comments? Go ahead, Mark. One here, which is just a little observation, and you're saying about, um, you know, referring to the master as the master or the king. Yeah. And there's this sort of lazy uh, tendency to always assume that it's talking about God, and, and this is how he will behave yeah. in certain well, situations. It's, it's, there's something that it, where it's an... It, it's an Jesus is quite happy to use imperfect analogies for the earthly sense, mm. but sometimes there's a tendency to try and therefore say everything about the earthly model we then apply up to God, and then if yeah. and if he's if he's being a good storyteller, as is often the way, and drawing things out from earthly institutions which people recognise that aren't so godly, we end up imputing or inferring that those ungodly elements belong to. To God the Father, <laughs> or, and very often that will scratch a religious itch as well. So it serves a purpose of, yeah, yeah. you know, weaponizing a, a verse for a certain certain purpose. Yeah, no. So you know, I think about <clears throat> you think about the the unrighteous steward who kind of defrauds his master. You know, if if you kind of infer that because just because it's a master, he's God, and um, there is something where God, Jesus is kind of saying, if if a master is like that on earth, well, think about how that might work for God. That's a different thing from saying God's just like that one, because then you're saying he's a bit stupid. <laughs> that master was a bit thick. He didn't realize he, he took a took a gamble on someone and got it wrong, which I don't think is what Jesus was saying. God in, in heaven is like. Um, so, yeah, you know, but but there is a sense, of course, in which he is because Jesus will say. But, it, you know, think about if it's like that on earth, what's it going to be like in heaven rather than it's like that on earth because it's exactly the same as it is in heaven. Mm. Yeah. It, Thank you, Kristen. Um, oh, sorry, am I interrupting? No, no, go ahead, Barbara. I find, I find you know, very interesting, that passage. It's, it's one I often come back to. And I think it's this sort of contrast, isn't it, with our, our tit-for-tat world where you do that and I do that. And, yeah. and it, it seems to me, I find the currency thing quite helpful because it's like we're dealing in another currency here, a yeah. currency of grace. Yeah. where we can never <clears throat> outdo God. So. Yeah, no, no, that's right. Yeah, the, the, the ironic thing in that one is the amount is so much that the only time you would have to pay it back is if the tormentors were demonic and you did have eternity, in which case you would you would get to pay it back, but we've always assumed you wouldn't be able to. <laughs> you know, I'm just trying to, I'm making the point, if we're too literalistic and say you owe 200,000 years worth of salary... <laughs> If you've got eternity, then well, well, you will pay it back. <laughs> but it, it, Jesus isn't trying to make that point. He's kind of trying to illustrate the 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 disproportionate impacts of of um, of how God is is gracious with mankind, and that that grace is so big and so heavy that our little things ought to be impacted and changed or challenged in some way if we're receiving it from Him. Do you think it, uh, uh, this is something I've wondered, whether it applies more uh, like on earth now that's in, in not forgiving, we're sort of stepping outside of the kingdom principles? Yes, yeah, so there's, there's a really good point, actually, which I didn't touch on as we were going through. <clears throat> you know, I think that Jesus' use of the word, which we I 
put in there as tor- tormentors, but they're kind of because torturers is too strong, jailers is too weak because of the the nature. But there is a sense in which has got nothing then to do with eternal destiny. But there is a sense in which forgiveness does become very tormenting to the soul. Um, that actually um, we we probably live with far more friction in our lives, and and the the grace isn't smooth like honey. It kind of <laughs> It irritates like uh, something else, you know. Um, we, we we probably do experience something of that that level of kind of frustration and torment in our Christian lives when we hold too strongly to our to our right to our right to to treat someone badly, <laughs> or to 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 use what to move from the from kind of wise caution to kind of actually um, my expression to you of my disapproval of you and dislike of you. <laughs> You know, and that that's a very subtle kind of boundary to try and work out. But but when we do find those who who find that we we do see ourselves f- walking with that scritchiness, and I would say, um, I think that probably, um, for most believers, if you have real hurt done to you, there is a season which you have to live with. You know, you have to work through through with the grace of the Lord before you get rid of that totally. Um, but you're quite capable of hanging on to it for eternity or for good, you know. So, so in other words, if if it's if it's really hard, that, that really something that really requires forgiveness, it takes a little bit of working through with the Lord and His mm-hmm. grace for you to be able to let go of it. Um, which is, I think, was part of the journey I was talking about, you know, um, um, you know, with some of what we we went through. You know, it, it wasn't instantaneous, and then I'd feel guilty, and then I'd thinking, well, where have I got to now? And as I say, on this occasion, I hadn't, was, as I look back on it, I realised I hadn't thought about it for a while. But for some reason, as I sat on the train, I was thinking about some things and feeling angry again. And then I was thinking, because I was angry, I hadn't forgiven, you know. And then I felt in that wonderfully gracious way, the Lord kind of really spoke back to me. <laughs> so, you know, you have, it's not wrong to look back and be angry, but you've let go generally. You're not worrying, you're not going through life affecting and trying to trying to make your make win your argument or make your point or whatever um so I'm, I'm not saying i'm perfect in these things but i'm just saying um i've tried to, i try to be realistic about the process in me and i suspect it's that that process is true for most um mm. be, and sometimes we don't do a service um by by oversimplify oversimplifying the process of forgiveness um, you know, with that kind of, well, I just forgive. No, it's not a problem. Um, well, if you don't care about something, it's not a problem. But if it really does hurt, you've got to work. You've got to really encounter the grace of God to be able to release it. This parable is almost the other way around. That the grace of God, if you're really encountering it, ought to be having an impact on you, and and you are being able to release stuff better. You should be mm. more forgiving. <laughs> um, it's kind of driving at the fact it's not just a, a transaction on paper. Our salvation. It's a process that that shapes us and changes us. Yes. And there is a choice involved in that, though, ongoingly, isn't there? Yeah. I think. So, like, in I can think of situations like that, and it it comes to your mind again. And in a sense, you just choose again, don't you? Okay, no, I don't want to live in bitterness. Uh, So rather than sort of condemning yourself, oh, no, I'm here again, you can just, like, flip it do you know what i mean and say no, no, okay no. i choose to forgive again <laughs> yeah no i choose to do it yeah because I, I always remember it's part of my own testimony of how i became a christian i remember at at spring harvest you know the speaker talking about jesus saying if you you know if you just love those who are like you what's that like in you know challenging us to think about um releasing people for forgiveness and there was a kid at school who i absolutely hated <laughs> because he used to pick on me the whole time as the butt of his jokes and I used to feel really small when he would do those things and I and and I remember when he said you know this is genuinely part of my my own journey I sometimes include it in my testimony I I um I said okay I can't f-, I, so I had I, in my prayer I actually said because he said I want you to pray about it and re- and I thought I can't but I made the decision I said okay I can't forgive this person because I just he just makes me really angry <laughs> But I said, I know, but I know you love him. So I'm, I said, I've given you permission to forgive him through me or to love him through me. And, um, and I often say the thing, cause I didn't really notice what happened, but two years later when I was being treated for cancer in hospital, 
Um, he, more than anybody else from my school, was the person who visited me in hospital. Um, and actually, he changed uh, our relationship changed totally. <laughs> now, that was a good year and a half after I prayed that prayer. Um, but but there's a kind of a sense where but that's the thing where we say, OK, I make a choice, but I know that the choice is beyond me. But I'm trying to do it with your help, you know, so you can. And I'm, I'm giving you permission in in me if that's the mm. the way to see it so mm. yeah that's great thank you, thank I, you about two years after that i made the mistake of trying to explain to him that process but he didn't really understand it <laughs> so, <laughs> i think he felt a little bit hurt that i was obviously di disliked him so much when he was so there you go you don't get unfortunately you don't get instantly wise when you become a christian <laughs> You tend to get that by working things through with the Lord over time. <laughs> Listen, when you told that story about the still feeling angry, but actually um, you had forgiven, I was thinking about um, the opposite to that, where you might have asked forgiveness for something. Yeah. So uh, particularly in an area of, say, an attraction towards somebody, um, which either resulted in adultery or could potentially lead to it, um, and something like that attraction would not go away either. In the same way that the anger would just dissipate and yeah, i think so, barbara so, like you were saying it's an active choice yes. um but yeah. but a, a not denying that that attraction is there but it, it you know even taking that to the lord but mm. there is an active choice um around that yes an and ongoing I, th thing. I think so because in that you can say i choose this relationship do you know what i mean mm. in yeah when when that comes up it's like no, or I have chosen this relationship instead. Or I... mm -hmm. does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Because <laughs> I remember working through that once and thinking, no, this is what I've chosen. No, mm -hmm. and, and actually, Again, it's a really, it. it becomes a really good example, Mark. And I, I, I'm not going to try and do it now because we'll, we, we'll, we go on for hours on this one if we do. <laughs> but it is the yes. of this, um, it's this tension of. We, we, often we think of ourselves as being in a state of something or having something in us when in fact the the truth we kind of get from scripture is we are this person so 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 it, you can't it's kind of like take this away from me well no this is who i am but there's something so so what god is doing in this is neither if you like um it's neither a status i'm angry or unforgiving or in love but actually that is much more complex than that is neither is it a feeling but somehow it's the whole composite of all of these things put together and to really understand whether we're living in unforgiveness or grace or whatever is something the lord sees and understands he just get but we've got some thermometers or litmus tests that we can try and get a feeling no i am forgiveness is having its way in me rather than going the other way um if i try and make it too forensic I, I tend to then think of it as something either that's in me or on me and therefore the Lord can lift it off or, or take it out of me. But the trouble is it is me. So so he and that's what he's redeeming. So, in fact, what he wants to do is bring that under his control and grace. Um, so and I think yeah. sometimes we, we sort of own these things when actually they're just temptations, aren't they? Yeah, that, that's you right. Because we see flow, in right. Jesus, it's, you know, he didn't but, sin, but all this stuff was going through him. And sometimes yeah. we just have to say well no i'm i'm not choosing that no so as i said there, there's probably we could kick off a huge <laughs> level of discussion and and doing it academically is less is often less useful than when you're doing it pastorally with someone because when you're doing it with dealing with these kind of things in that pastoral sense you're often seeing really positive for that person sense of growth and trans and transformation and actually and and it creates that testimony that they love the lord for so we should be talking about it but not just for an academic kind of point of view it's kind of the thing that that is actually right at the heart of 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 the discipleship process the pastoring process the transformation process that's going on as we're being transformed by the renewing of our minds <laughs> um, not because we've got a new piece of knowledge or we we declare something new but because both the knowledge and the declarations become part of the whole of who we are um that's becoming a more gracious person i really liked Kristen the way in which you brought out the fact that 70 times seven isn't every time no I think often within particularly within christian circles there's a real misunderstanding around that whole thing of um forgiving and people being required to forgive and therefore pretend it never yeah. happened 
Yeah, and I think the problem is the way we work, we, we use a word and then we simplify what it really means. So forgiving means a kind of a bunch of things which actually sometimes are almost impossible um, in certain circumstances. Um, but actually it, it's it, that little marker, the word, is, is about a process that the Lord's doing in us. Um, you know, that that if we had a proper word for it, it would be, it would be a book long, you know, because <laughs> it would be so nuanced and whatever. But we kind of roughly know where it's heading, but we have to be cautious with that, mm. with them. Um, with casually imposing it on people, um, you know, because as again, you know, it's one of those things from a, it's from a pastoral point of view, you realize how, how things that seem simple, um, when they're casually imposed, because someone doesn't really get how hard they are, become, become actually what we were talking about a couple of weeks ago, which is causing offense to those who are younger in their faith. <laughs> you know, we actually make, we give them problems to overcome it, um, instead of leading them through those things, yeah. mm -hmm. I think we can make so. it impossible. Really, yeah. You know. Good. It's great well. to, to to understand the sort of the historical, you know, context of that of that story. Yeah. So I mean, I I can't quote the the, the things for you, but I've seen it. You know, you could, it, it it will actually tell you kind of what ta what of the twelve tablets of the of the Roman Constitution. Um, Kind of you know getting getting your money's worth out of debtors is in, but but every all of the, the process kind of fits within that that framework apparently. So, <laughs> but uh, good. Well, we we've, we've had we've had an hour, so I I, I uh, you know the the longer the videos are, the less likely someone is to watch it all the way through. But <laughs> <laughs> but you know, but uh, you might make it through. Right. Well, I if that's okay, I will I will say my goodbyes and get get preparing for the. The kids we have coming through church tomorrow. Thanks so much, Kristen. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you very much, Kristen. Yeah. Bye. Bye. See you then. Bye bye. Bye, bye. 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 b